Third Sabbath of November. Billy, you'll be here the third Sabbath of November? You won't be? When do you leave? Oh, well then you're off the hook. That's too bad. I was going to challenge you. We're going to finish up our study of Esther in the ninth chapter. And as you're flipping there, I want to tell you a story of a, of a Lutheran pastor, a German pastor, at the time of World War II. When you read his, his name is uh, Martin Neimuller. When you read his story, early on he thought Hitler, he thought that was going to be a great benefit for the nation of Germany. The last two years of the Hitler's reign, Martin began speaking out against Hitler. And someone asked him about his experience, because he spent two years in a German camp. And he wrote a poem that, that expressed his transition of being supportive to speaking out against the evils. And it's, the poem is called The Evil of Silence. And so first it came for the Jews. But I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because, well, I wasn't a communist. Then they spoke out against the trade unionists and came and took them. So I didn't say anything because I wasn't a trade unionist. It's just then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak. In the, ninth, in the eighth and ninth chapter of Esther, that question gets asked, who gets to live and who gets to die? In chapter eight, both Esther and Haman face death and both plead for their lives. And when Esther reveals that Haman is her mortal enemy, she at the same time reveals that the last five years that a Jew has been living in the Harlem. And, yes. and then the king's wife is Jewish. It also means that she's now under the death decree. And oh, by the end of the chapter, when we come to the ninth chapter, Haman is already dead. But, it, but Esther's plea for her life and for the life of her people has yet to be answered. So join me in chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, Now in the twelfth month, that is, the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree do near to be put to, in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, thought it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. Verse 2, the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the providences of King Ezra's to lay hands on such as sought the hurt and no man to withstand them for the fear of them <coughs> fell upon all the people. Verse 3, all the rulers of the providences and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the kings, officers of the king, helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. Verse 4, for Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, waxed greater and greater. And finally, verse 5, thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, the slaughter and the destruction, and did what they would do unto those who hated them. Sometimes wonder why these stories are in the Bible. And the servant Lord tells us in Prophets and Kings 605 that the trying experiences that came upon God's people in the days of Esther is not unique. She tells us that it reflects the times of the end of, for God's people. She says, the revelator looking down to the ages to the close of time has declared 
The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The final decree against the remnant people of God will be similar to the decree issued by Asterisk against the Jews. The enemies of God's people. They will see Sabbath keepers as Mordecai at the gate. And they will be angry. And they will attempt to destroy this little group of people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So men have honored Satan's principles above the principles that rule heavens and they have accepted the false Sabbath. Testimonies of the church is on this battlefield comes the last great conflict of controversy between truth and error, and we are not left with a doubt in the issue. And now in the days of Esther and Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. Isn't that good news? God will vindicate us and vindicate his truth just as he did in the days of Esther. Notice verse 12 of chapter 9. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have, have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace, and the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's province? And what is your petition? And it shall be granted. But what is your request further? And it shall be done. Then said Esther, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews that are in Susa to do tomorrow also according to this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king embarked, excuse me, the king commanded, So be it done. And a decree was given in Susa, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. If you're with uh, social media, well, the ten sons of Haman were posted. That was the social media of their era. When people saw this, they said, oh, don't go that way. Don't, don't be like those kind of people. These were gruesome times described in chapter 9. Anybody who rejected the king's authority suffered. Talk about 500 dying in the first part of 9. The latter part of chapter 9 tells us that 75,000 people lost their lives in those two days. What we learned is the day of judgment had reached, the day of judgment had reached the enemies of the Jewish people. Really, they had reached the enemy of God. God's people were law-abiding citizens. People wanted to destroy them. They wanted to, Satan wanted to wipe out any evidence of God. It didn't work. It did not work. And when, in the chapter 8, when the king says, hang and hang on his gallows, he had this gallows built 75 feet tall. It was magnificent compared to any ever built before him. What he didn't realize was he was building his own gallows. Even his wife warned him. She said, you know, when, when um, Haman told his wife that Mordecai, he never bows, he, he never does anything I want him to do. And, and now the king had been marching through the streets and singing his praise. And she said, you know, Mordecai is a Jew. And Haman could not stand before him, but he will bring your ruin, which he told us in chapter 6. Now, the victory that the Jews fought wasn't by their power their might. Prophets and Kings 6.02, it says the angels that excelled in strength were sent there to defend God's people. 
Isn't it good to know that throughout Earth's history, when God's people are threatened, God sends his angels. We, we may not be aware of their presence, but they're there. They're guiding us. Haman's evil, wherever it occurred, for whatever motivation, whatever his motivation was, it was an affront to God's righteousness. And we see divine judgment against Haman. And that's the same that we'll see in the verse history. You know, Haman thought he could get away with being evil. He was the face, what we're called the poster child for evil. He spent his days and his nights plotting how he could destroy the Jewish people. Specifically, to destroy Mordecai, he wanted to wipe out an entire race to get rid of one man. He was the face of evil. And the book of Esther reminds us that God has an ultimate solution for the problem of evil. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, the righteous will cry out, This is our God for whom we have waited. But the wicked will cry out for the rocks to fall upon them. What makes a difference? Why is one group of people so excited when they see Jesus come in the clouds of glory and another group so terrified? It's because Jesus cannot protect the wicked. Because they do not have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are not clothed with his righteousness. Amen. And so when God comes, when Jesus comes in his glory, his King of kings and lords of lords, his radiating glory will destroy the wicked. Amen. They cannot stand in his presence. But the righteous stand because they're clothed with Christ's righteousness. Amen. And they stand not by their power, but by his power. Haman is evil. And in Psalms 37, that, that, um, that we just read a few minutes ago, David carries on a conversation. He says, you know, I'm a follower of God. And I like being a follower of God. There are a lot of great things about it. Especially the gift of forgiveness. But David says, you know, I look at the wicked, and they prosper. They eat, and they sleep, and they play, and they do whatever they want to do. And he says, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to want to be like the lost. It seems like they have no problems. But then he says, the wicked will wither. You know, when a, when a plant is lacking water, lacking moisture, like in your story, the, the plants begin to wither and die. And he says, the difference between being a righteous person and being a wicked person is the righteous flourishes. The wicked wither. And like Haman, they'll be destroyed. There is, a, there is a delusion with being evil. It is the delusion that you can get away with it. And God won't do anything about it. David said that's not true. And the book of Esther tells us that's not true. Haman thought that he could be as evil as he wanted because he was powerful, he was rich, he was the second man in command of the kingdom of Persia. And he thought there would never be a consequence. And he built that gallows, that colossal gallows for Mordecai. And he was hanged on it, or impaled on it. Haman had boasted to his friends that he was he was being honored to be in the presence of the king and the queen. He thought he was going to banquets. He didn't realize it was his death decree. He didn't realize that his 
destiny because of his evil was about to come to an end. On the final judgment day when the truth is revealed, the condemned will finally realize that they have nobody to blame but themselves. Amen. They can't say, well, God wasn't fair because God has been more than fair. Amen. While reflecting on who gets life and who gets death, the author of the book of Esther reveals that life and death are determined by our identification with God's people. Haman identified himself with evil people. And his ultimate reward is death. Esther identified herself with God's people. And even though there was a death decree over their heads, she was justified. Because it was God's people. And that's a significant choice we have to make. Who will we identify ourselves with? The people of God or the people of the world? You know, sometimes we like to do that little dance where we put one foot in the church and one foot in the world and we try to live both lives. That's what we call a sad Christian. Because there's no happiness being half committed to Jesus, is it? No. Really ha real happiness only comes when we totally surrender our lives of Jesus Christ. Because our possessions, they're temporary. You know, Marty talked about tornadoes. I lived in South Dakota for several years, and there was a tornado that came through a small town. There was about a hundred homes in that town, which included a bank. When the tornado was done, the bank building no longer existed. Just the vault. Sat there all by itself. And at that same particular location, there was this large tower. And a semi truck had been lifted off the ground and thrown into that tower, and it collapsed. And there was a man standing next to me looking at it, and he says, What do you think happened? Because you see, he represented a company who built those towers and they were indestructible. And I looked at it and I said, well, I think the tornado threw that semi in and destroyed it because nothing is indestructible. Amen. The things of this world are so temporary. I mean, homes consume the fires. We were just talking recently about it house fire, where the whole house was burnt to the ground. The only thing that survived was the family Bible. Oh, wow. The only thing. We could not be happy with being half Jesus and half worldly. There's no joy in there. Because the world doesn't recognize God. It doesn't recognize Jesus Christ and his covenant promises that he's made. In John 14, verse 19, Jesus said to the disciples, Because I live, you also will live. And that's a promise to us as well. Because Jesus hung on the cross, died for us, and now is resurrected, because he lives, we will live. To be outside of Christ is to be numbered among the people of God has already condemned to death. Genesis 3. Eat of this fruit and you will die. Or as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. We really have a choice to make, don't we? To be all in for Jesus or all in for the world. We might think that we can play that game, but we can't. <coughs> because fallen human nature sets itself against God. It's only as we're restored through Jesus Christ. We are called to walk by faith. 
You have our mission statement? Amen. Amen. Walking together in Christ. Didn't say walking by ourselves, does it? But it's walking together in Christ. Through prayer, love, health, and sharing. It's no fun walking alone. But we've been told that people walk, as Jesus says, as I live, so shall you live. Choose you this day to walk with Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the story of Haman is so tragic. The story of humanity and what it does to humanity is so tragic. So many lives have been snuffed out because people didn't like someone. But Lord, help us put our complete trust in you. Help us to choose to be an Esther, not to be a Haman. Help us not to be comfortable with sin, but to only be comfortable with Jesus. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name.